Well, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for being here with us today. I'm Assembly Member Rebecca Bauer Cahan, um, California Assembly Member for District 16, which probably is most of you. Uh, and it's so it's an honor to be here with you and welcome you to this important presentation. I'll note that you can add closed captioning to the event through Zoom down at the bottom. So if you want that, just turn it on with the live transcript button. Um, and I want to thank Contra Costa County Deputy District Attorney Mary Knox and Detective Zach Williams from the Contra Costa County Office of the Sheriff for providing this event to all of us um, in our community. Their trainings are well-researched, thorough, and really um, easy enough for people like me to understand. So I hope you get a lot out of this today. You know, my office has hosted uh, scam, stalker, scam stopper workshops in the past and it continues to be a need. So today's workshop is focused on scams perpetrated online via text or via phone targeting seniors. Seniors are the most targeted group for scams. One in five seniors has been the victim of a scam. In fact, the U.S. Department of Justice reports that seniors lose $3 billion due to scammers every year. And I know I'm committed to keeping our community safe for everyone, including protecting our seniors from scams. And so are our incredible speakers who are going to help us do just that with the workshop today. So this is going to help us learn what we can do, how we can be alert and ready to act when we come across a possible scammer. I want to thank you for spending your afternoon with us to learn how to protect yourselves and others from a scam. Prevention is always better than having to deal with it after the fact. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about our speakers. Deputy District Attorney Mary Knox has been with the Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office since 1985. Thank you for your long service uh, and has a vast and diverse experience in the justice field. She's worked in community violence reduction, juvenile justice, homicide, criminal prosecution, narcotic vendor prosecution, and currently works in the elder abuse unit. She graduated from UCLA with her undergraduate degree and went to Pepperdine University School of Law to get her Juris Doctorate. She's a published author and a revered trainer in her field. So we are really lucky to have her here training all of us today. Um, we also have Detective Zachary Williams. Detective Williams joined us from the Special Victims Unit of the Contra Costa Office of the Sheriff. He's worked for the Sheriff's Department for 14 years and for the Sacramento County District Attorney's Office for seven years prior to that. So we have two amazing public servants who've given many years to our community. So thank you both uh, for being here. I know that you are all in good hands with these stellar public servants. And without further delay, Mary and Zach, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to you all who are attending for this presentation this afternoon. We're excited to share information with you about um, online scams and hopefully help you prevent yourselves from becoming victims. Today our goals are that uh, we believe that if we can increase awareness of and re reporting of elder abuse scams that we can reduce the amount of incidents. The scope of the problem related to elder abuse and elder scams um, has become exponential as our elder population has been increasing exponentially. Um, and seniors control almost 70% of the nation's wealth. So as the assembly member mentioned that seniors are really targeted by the scammers because they have um, Frankly, they have the assets that are attracting the scammers. Nine out of 10 people who perpetrate elder abuse um, involve family members, but with the scammers, it's a very different situation. With the scammers, almost all of the, um, the scams are perpetrated by strangers. Some reasons for the lack of reporting are that seniors are often afraid of being a burden or losing independence if it becomes obvious they're not managing their finances properly and are susceptible to manipulation. Many others I've worked with were embarrassed or humiliated about being victimized. And sometimes seniors fear that they can't properly explain what happened and that they won't be believed. Uh, you know, with our ever evolving technology, this has become an, an even more present problem in our reporting. And reasons for victimization, um, especially with the advent of electronic banking and credit card access via the internet, seniors have a great vulnerability 
to the financial abuse and scams because they're often isolated and lack contact with family or friends to help them um, research their credit card statements online and their bank statements online. Um, disabilities just due to aging frequently um, cause limitations on social interaction and oftentimes um, cognition issues um, increase their dependence on others and make them vulnerable. Seniors are also very trusting. Seniors tend to come from generations who um, expect that they'll be told the truth, that people won't try and take advantage of them. And quite frequently, these scammers who, um, frankly, in the, in the old days would have been called con men, um, they are very talented at finding those little chinks in the armor that make the seniors vulnerable to the scams. And oftentimes, you know, sometimes in the 90 percentile, the abusers are family or people from their trusted circle. So the goal of this meeting is that uh, please, please don't leave this meeting with an overwhelming sense of fear or distrust for other people. The reason we wanted to share this information is to increase awareness of the types and amounts of scams going on in the world today. We don't want to make you afraid, just more cautious. Due to the increasing sophistication of the types of scams out there now, they are believable. They're very believable. We want to take every opportunity to share information and increase awareness. The goal is that our elders and our elder protectors think about what they're being told and verify the information before releasing any sensitive information or any money. Now we're going to talk about some different types of scams. Most scams involve um, a violation of trust and um, most Elders report being victimized by people within their circle of trust. That can be family members, it can be caregivers, it can be people who actually befriend elders to take advantage of them. For example, um, we have a case involving a bank employee that began interacting with um, an elder client with some significant assets. And so by volunteering to help her with um, you know, small banking issues and things like that, she eventually gained her trust and the elder victim was so trusting of her and her position at the bank. She never discussed any of this with her family members until over $500,000 um, was embezzled from her bank accounts. So these types of scams result from a violation of our elders' trust by someone who's been entrusted with access to finances. Usually this occurs through a person helping another with their finances and bills and then exploiting that access for their own gain. It's okay to ask trusted people to help you with your finances. Just don't trust completely. Monitor your accounts and spending to make sure things are as they should be. Question unexplained purchases and money transfers. If you are unfamiliar with a certain type of technology used for finances, Take the time to learn about it before you provide someone with the ability to use that technology for your finances. For example, don't allow someone even that you trust, for example, to make purchases for you on Amazon until you fully understand what's involved in monitoring Amazon purchases um, so that you can make sure that the purchases that are being made are those that you authorized. Or using um, apps like DoorDash or Grubhub or any other kind of app, um, make sure that you know how to monitor it before you give someone access to that app or account. So many people have their relative shop for them. It's just not wise to let it go unmonitored because that's when the trust violations begin. Let's talk a little bit about your security. Okay. Uh, there are uh, more and more types of uh, online and virtual applications for you to do things like banking and online money transfers, um, account access, things like that, uh, even receiving mail via email. And it's, uh, there, there's all kinds of room for security violations. So we want to get some of this information out there about how this has happened. Phone money transfer applications seem to be the newest cutting edge of how to move money around uh, virtually. Uh, a lot of these are internet applications. Um, I could think of one off the top of my head, uh, Cash App, it seems to be the most popular new application. It's basically like a virtual bank. 
if you use these internet applications and allow other people to access your app, your apps and your account, monitor what's going on, uh, monitor your accounts and the transaction statements you get regularly to make sure that your accounts are not being accessed without your permission and that all the transactions are approved. It's something you're aware of. Once money's transferred, it's most likely that the bank will not refund it. So once that money's gone, if somebody accessed your account and moved the money, it's gone. That goes for online banking as well. Monitor your bank accounts and make sure people are not remotely accessing your account. With as many ways as there are to get into bank accounts online now through devices and computers, you can access them from almost anywhere in the world. Once you have the passcode, and you can identify the account, you can get into it from anywhere. So make sure that uh, you're monitoring these things regularly, at least once a month, if not uh, twice, just to make sure that everything's as it should be, the balance is as it should be, and there aren't a bunch of unauthorized transactions on the account you're not aware of. Keep track of who has access to your accounts and your passwords. Always keep your passwords in a safe and secure place and never keep them in your wallet or purse. Uh, Oftentimes when you lose a wallet or purse or if it's stolen out of your car, I know uh, at least in the Bay Area, auto burglaries are, are ever increasing. Um, if you have all the information stored in one place, it makes it way too easy for pe people to get your passcode and your account number and get in there and victimize you. Uh, be sure to lock all your bank cards, checkbooks, bank statements, documents with your identifying information, anything like that, and always keep it in a secure place. Never place any documents with sensitive information on them in the trash. Uh, always shred these documents before disposing of them. And also, if you can, get a lockable mailbox or a post office box. Your personal identifying information, once it's out um, onto the streets, and um, it's, it's amazing the numbers of um, People specialize in creating new identities and opening open credit cards, open bank accounts, transfer money back and forth between them, all with the information they can get out of your trash. Mm -hmm. um, Detective Williams can tell stories about people, identity thieves who are arrested with literally hundreds of victims, personal identifying information that they've gotten from basically stealing mail out of mailboxes and breaking into cars. It's become very, very common. Um, there's even a, a work for it in, the, in this, uh, I guess, industry, what we call it. Uh, they call it mailboxing, where people make a profession of going around at night when people are asleep and stealing mail or prying mailboxes open from the secured ones and stealing massive amounts of mail so they can glean information. Uh, they filter that into a ledger, and then they, they actually sell identities. Uh, once they've used it to uh, a point where they can't use it anymore, they'll sell it to somebody else, and then somebody else in another area will start using that information. So if your information gets out there, it can be a long process of getting it stopped and getting it corrected. I know we've cross arrested and prosecuted people for uh, setting up shop like in hotels where they're, they're actually meeting with clients to uh, sell them identities with information they've stolen from folks from the mail and from uh, stuff they can glean online through all the different uh, information search websites that are out there. Identity theft scams. There are, a lot, there are people out there that will use your good name and credit to pay their way in life. Identity theft is one of the most prevalent crimes today due to its high profitability and the low risk to the perpetrator. Identity theft cases are very difficult to prove in court, so there's not a lot of accountability for these crimes. So we're trying to do our best, but it's hard to prove some of these things when people are working remotely from sometimes outside of the United States. It's easier to prevent these types of crimes than to hold the suspects responsible for them. Oftentimes, the damage from these types of crimes is lifelong. Money can't be recovered and credit scores will not usually be restored. There are relief methods that we can do, but it's a lot easier to get out of it, get out of the head of this and stop it. Prevention is the best defense. Monitor your identity, identity and your credit. Getting a free credit check every six to 12 months is a good idea. You can go to any of the major uh, credit reporting agencies, Equifax, TransUnion, or Experian and just get a free credit check just to see what's out there under your name. Always question any suspicious mail or bills. 
And for example, if you start receiving um, mail from a credit card company and you're thinking it's just a solicitation from the credit card company, make sure to really look at that and make sure that it's not an actual credit card that's been opened in your name by someone else. Um, I know that we all get lots of um, junk mail, but it's really important to monitor these, the mail that is coming from credit card companies or from banks to make sure that this is not an account that's been opened in your name. And the concept about never giving your personal identifying information to anyone without verifying who they are. Um, frequently, there are now phone calls from uh, people who identify themselves as, oh, a representative from PG&E or a representative from some other public agency who's asking for verification, or you'll get a text message asking for verification of some sort of information. And of course, we're all just very trusting and try and be helpful. But um, I think that we're all fam familiar with agencies who now are routinely sending out messages saying, we will never ask for any identifying information over the phone or via email. So, please be sure to question. And even if the scammers uh, give you a pretty legitimate sounding uh, explanation, ask for a callback number. And then you call them back before you ever ask the questions. And you can sometimes then Google that number to make sure it's actually a number associated with, for example, PG&E. But then, even some of the scammers are able to clone the phone numbers of some of these different agencies. So that's not 100%, but definitely once you start requiring them to verify who they are, then things get more complicated for them. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Mary's right. Uh, sometimes uh, the scammers are calling from call centers that have been set up somewhere, sometimes outside of the United States, sometimes within. And if you try to disconnect the call and call them back at the number they give, you're not going to reach the same person and you're, you're going to confuse them. They're not going to know where the scam left off and, you know, you'll disarm them. You'll, you know, they, you'll realize that it's not real. Another way that you can do, uh, you can kind of vet these out is you can call, uh, disconnect the call, call the actual service center or customer service center from your last statement. If you do business with that company or that agency or utility company, and contact them and ask them if they reached out to you. They'll have a record if it was legitimate. Uh, another thing that you can do, uh, well, I know not everyone is tech savvy. Uh, they are not uh, comfortable uh, navigating through different websites. Uh, you can hire companies. There are companies out there like LifeLock that will monitor your identity and your credit for you. And they will let you know and they will flag anything that, that looks suspicious and they'll get your approval for it before they let it go through. So if, if you're experiencing uh, a, a large number of these kind of calls or uh, fraud attempts, you can always hire a company to monitor that for you. And like we talked about before, shred all your sensitive documents and make sure you're locking your mailbox and your PO box. So as we discussed a little bit earlier, um, absolutely. Bankers are, are generally extremely trustworthy people, um, but be wary. If a bank employee is getting too friendly with you or just offering um, unsolicited assistance um, and a banker should never offer to take on the role of being your personal banker, unless of course you've hired them, um, for example, um, someone through Wells Fargo Advisors um, to handle your investments and your and making payments for you and they should never have access to any of your credit cards or your checkbook or your personal identifying information exactly. these aren't the most common types of scams but when they do happen they're usually very extensive where life savings are lost and uh, just watch for red flags. If you ever see a banker taking too much interest, um, the banks can audit and see how many times their employees are accessing your accounts. And normally they test these type of things on their own and they'll let us know. 
but uh, if you're uh, seeing a banker taking way too much interest in you and your accounts, asking unusual questions that don't make sense, or if you find out an access card or a checkbook or anything like that has been issued without your permission, let law enforcement know right away. And also just on the flip side of this, many of the reports that we get of banking elder abuse, um, that's coming directly from the banks themselves. And a lot of the tellers and other bankers are really great about um, identifying perhaps someone bringing an elder into a bank and seemingly exercising too much control over that elder and the finances. So the banks have been uh, very, um, very protective of the elders that are coming into their banks and notifying law enforcement. Yeah, we've had a great amount of cooperation. Uh, when I was working in the patrol division, we would have bank managers call in when those suspicious circumstances would come in. When people would come in uh, assisting an elder and almost seeming to suggest that they do transactions at the bank, then they would let us know, go help out. Inherited scam. So we want to let everybody know to be cautious of those who seek to gain from you. Uh, children and loved ones should not be fixated on inheriting your money and property. If you feel you're being manipulated or exploited, always seek the advice of an uninvolved, trusted person. Most estate lawyers will give a free consultation. It is unfortunate, but many families have a vulture who is circling around waiting to pick the bones of the family estate. I know that sounds a little harsh, but I will get a lot of these types of cases. Be cautious of relative pressure you to sign over accounts, property, or power of attorney to them without making sure they can be trusted. Make sure that your wishes for your spending, your end of life plan, ongoing care, and what you want done with your estate is laid out clearly in a plan. Have that plan notarized and kept on record with your will or your living trust. Somewhere it can be easily found by your family. If you feel you're being manipulated into giving away power over your estate and your finances, report it to law enforcement for help. There are resources available to assist you with abuse prevention and setting up an estate plan. And in Contra Costa County, um, Empowered Aging, that was formerly known as the Ombudsman's Office, has all kinds of resources available um, to help elders um, who are having issues um, in this arena. There's legal assistance, there's our, our county guardian system, there are different advocacy groups that can help out uh, both before and after. If anything bad happens to you, they're available then, but we can get out ahead of this as well. If you need assistance in structuring any of these types of things, reach out and let us know. Some examples of inherited scams. Uh, relatives asking you to sign over power of attorney then changing your will to be the sole inheritor and owner of all of your property. Convincing you to sign over power of attorney then using that to transfer the title of all owned property into their name or joint name and then taking out loans against the property leaving the family in debt. Having an elder deemed incompetent then taking power of attorney over the state for their own gain inappropriately pressuring an elder to remove relatives from a will that they deem are unworthy in order to affect how the estate is divided. Convincing an elder to commit unsound financial decisions that drain finances and property values, such as a reverse mortgage. And relatives asking to be paid out their share of an inheritance prior to the relative passing. Now let's talk about financial abuse through emotional abuse. Uh, this is something that we do see a lot of. If you have relatives or caregivers who exploit money or property from you by making you feel guilty about being a burden for them to take care of, report it to law enforcement. Do not allow yourself to be controlled by an overbearing relative or caregiver. If you're being pressured or intimidated into making decisions or having your freedoms restricted inappropriately, it is abuse and should be reported to law enforcement immediately. Be cautious about allowing people to be dependent on you. Uh, oftentimes you said it's the people closest to you are the ones who are gonna abuse you and take advantage of you. Don't be afraid to question things and seek an outside opinion from someone you trust. Let's talk about some of the utility scams that Mary mentioned earlier. 
A lot of the scammers are calling pretending to be from utility companies such as PG&E, uh, phone companies, and cable and internet providers. They have very convincing scams such as setting up, uh, settling up for missed payment or promotions for upgrades. Oftentimes they have some of your information already that they've cleaned off the internet. They oftentimes use programmable phones like Mary mentioned so that the call appears to come from a legitimate source. The readout on your phone might even say PG&E or the phone company. Legitimate utility companies will never request payment by loadable gift cards. They never accept payment over the telephone and never give out your account or payment information over the telephone. You will, you will not be arrested for failure to pay utility bills. That's how a lot of times they premise this. If the caller threatens to have your utility shut off, hang up and call the contact number on your last statement to verify this is real before paying anything. If it sounds suspicious, it is. Always call back and verify before giving out any information. And this, um, this type of scam has been going on in Contra Costa County. Um, and crazily with them literally threatening to shut off power and requiring the loadable like Visa gift cards for payments of outstanding bills. So um, the scammers get very creative. It's if, if all of this energy could go into good, they would be quite a force to really bring some great uh, good to our county. But um, they're very creative and particularly never allow someone from, for example, PG&E to come into your house unless you have an appointment set. Um, that's an excellent way for people to get into your house and then potentially steal personal identifying information or worse. Always verify the validity of a work crew coming unannounced. We just recently had one of these pg &E scams that uh, the family uh, reported and uh, we were able to track it to the Dominican Republic for different search warrants to the cellular phone companies that they were using. Uh, so we handed the case over to the federal government. Hopefully we'll see some results from that. Technical help scam. Scammers call or email inquire if you need assistance with making your computer faster or removing viruses. I, I know we've all got these before. If you click the link on a suspicious email, sometimes it actually installs a virus that locks your computer up and shows you a message to call them. Uh, they try to sort you into paying money to have your computer fixed. And even if you pay, the computer never gets fixed. Other scammers try and use the guise of helping you with your computer to trick you into providing the password so they can access all of your things on your computer like your online banking. Scammers send out legitimate looking mailers that try to get you to contact them through what appears to be a legitimate website or call center. The number of website may be similar enough to the real one, maybe just one digit off for a company such as Apple that you don't notice it's not the real contact information for Apple. So always verify these types of requests through the company's real customer service center before you give out any, any information or confirm any information they have, and especially making any payments. Never give anyone the passwords for your computer or your accounts. Never pay anyone to remove a virus from your computer unless it's a trusted source, like a technician from a mobile computer service like Geek Squad or a help desk like Apple Geniuses when you make the appointments to go into the store. A lot of, you're gonna get a lot of cold calls from people soliciting these type of services that you're not expecting. And you know you might think to yourself, yeah, my computer is a little slow. Maybe I can use some help. And then they'll start to ask you for your personal identifying information and your password so they can access it. And that's when things should take a turn for the worse. And a legitimate um, person trained to actually give you expert IT service will be able to remote into your computer and not need your passwords at all. So the minute someone asks for your password, you should be on high alert. That's a red flag. They make this equipment. They can get in there without our passwords. They don't need that. And anytime you're asked for it, it it's a red flag. Always make sure that the situation is real before giving out any information. We've seen some internal revenue service scams lately. This was a big one in our county. Uh, scammers are pretending to be with the IRS to scam people into paying money. They call with a very convincing story about how you miscalculated on your taxes and you owe back taxes to the IRS. 
Uh, a lot of times they'll have your identifying information. They'll know where you live. They'll know identifying information. They'll know your phone number. They'll know your address. They'll, they have everything. And they'll threaten legal and civil pen penalties if you don't pay. They request payment through unusual methods like gift cards, um, online money transfers through applications. The IRS does not operate in this manner. If you owe back taxes, you'll be contacted by an IRS agent. They normally request a meeting in person and they'll tell you what to bring to assist them in an audit. You would uh, be audited and aware of what's happening before being asked to pay anything. The IRS will never cold call you and request that you pay them anything immediately over the phone. So, and I think that these um, IRS scams are really targeting um, victims that are not, um, that come from other countries to the United States. For example, I have a friend um, who um, is Russian and has lived in this country for many, many years as a highly educated. And he called to tell me that he was on his way to meet an IRS agent to pay him $700 in the parking lot of the 7-Eleven. And I was like, whoa, stop, don't go. Um, and for him, where in his experience in Russia, that was not unusual. So um definitely the scammers can create these scams that they know are going to appeal to people who don't have the experience that perhaps native americans have mm -hmm. another thing i think we should mention these types of scams it's it's difficult to figure out where they're coming from because they're always done remotely they're never in person um, make sure that you're reporting these things. If, you, if somebody contacts you and you realize that it's a scam and they're trying to say that they're from the government, copy down whatever information they're willing to get. And you can, it's a simple process. It doesn't take a lot of your time. You can go to uh, almost every police department and sheriff's department I can think of in California has an online reporting system where you can easily log on it in under 10 minutes, uh, pass the information along so that we can gather it and use that to identify the people doing this. And the numbers from the, the readout on your phone, either your landline or your cell phone, um, providing that telephone number to law enforcement can be uh, crucial in, in tracking down the scammers. A lot of times the information you can provide us is the only way we can solve the case. Threat scams. Scammers will call and try to scare you into paying them money. Uh, these are pretty common. I've, I've worked with a lot of these in the East Bay. They gather information about you prior to the call, and they may know things about uh, about you to help them convince you to pay. Uh, I've uh, investigated cases where people have claimed to have uh, custody of friends and relatives of the people they're calling, and they claim that they'll hurt them if you don't pay immediately. Uh, they may claim that they're watching you. They may send you pictures of yourself from social media or from photos that you've shared online. Um, I've worked cases where they've had uh, photos of people's homes that they've taken from real estate listings, and they've sent those to their, their target to try and convince them to pay, saying that we know where you live. Um, these are scary. These are the kinds of calls that when we take them, when our patrol division goes out to meet the victims, they're very, very upset. They're crying. They're very emotional because they're scared. Um, they may threaten violence against you. Uh, one of the more recent ones that I had, the, uh, the suspects were sending uh, videos of very explicit um, violence to try and scare and persuade the victims into pain. Uh, these, are, these folks are very aggressive and they're very scary. Uh, they come out with all kinds of scams uh, that they have a sniper trained on you and that they're gonna shoot you if you don't go immediately and load a gift card with money and give them the code. Uh, they send you a picture of your house and they say that they're going to come send somebody to burn it down. Uh, they tell you that they have hostages or that uh, they're going to they have pictures of you that they got from your cell phone camera and they're going to send those to your coworkers if you don't pay. Uh, never pay these scammers, never give them or confirm any information that they have. Hang up immediately and call 911. Uh, we can take over from there. We can check your phone log. We can uh, check cameras in the area, see who's been around your home. Uh, don't don't stay on the line and don't give or confirm any information. And definitely never pay them. Arrest scans. Uh, these are something new 
that we've been seeing. Uh, my department's been dealing with this over the last year. Our, the scammers call and pretend to be an officer with a law enforcement agency. They call from a programmable phone that makes it look like their call is legitimate. The readout on your phone will actually say Contra Costa Sheriff. Sometimes it'll even have the number for our dispatch center. Uh, that happened to our agency uh, all over the west end of our county. People were being scammed. They tell you they have a warrant for your arrest due to failure to pay taxes or fines or tickets. They provide real names of people that we have listed on our websites that are civil unit or patrol division employees that uh, they copy down off of our websites. These are very, very convincing scams. Uh, they're able to convince a lot of people that there are officers on the way to arrest them if they don't pay their fines right away. Uh, please understand law enforcement will never, never ask you to pay something directly to an officer or over the telephone or use unconventional methods such as a gift card. This does not happen. All fines and fees for law enforcement are paid to the court or to a, like a county or city reception area. So be aware that law enforcement does not operate in this way. If a warrant was issued for your arrest, they would never call you first. They would come to your house in person and arrest you. Bail for a warrant is never paid directly to the law enforcement officer and would never be done over the telephone. Law enforcement does not collect debts in this way. Always be wary of calls of this nature. Don't pay or provide any information to the caller. Hang up and report it. Giveaway scams. You have this a personal great. experience. I would I let do. you take this one. I do. My, um, my mother received an offer from Visa. Um, being such a valued customer um, and having spent some amount of money using her credit card, they offered her uh, free gifts. So she, um, she asked for the free gifts and um, I hadn't realized that she'd done this until I went to visit her and we were talking about Christmas presents for my nieces. And she said, well, I just got these in the mail there, they were earbuds and uh, an Apple style smartwatch. And so we were talking about asking where she had gotten them and she explained the whole Visa thing. And we were kind of looking at them thinking, huh? And then all of a sudden it hit us, all of these, both of these devices will connect, you know, um, to an iPhone so that everything that's on your iPhone or other wireless devices is now connected to this smartwatch and the earbuds so that whoever sent these to my mom could then collect all of the information off of her iPhone and her wireless laptop and everything else. So um, that was a, a hit pretty close to home and it took, it kind of, um, was sobering when all of a sudden we realized what had happened and potentially what could have happened to my mom. So um, I think the old adage is absolutely true. Uh, you never get something for nothing. So there's a reason that people are offering you things for free. And also the, you know, I think we all have experience with the, you know, you've won a certain prize or, doing, you know, just enter this particular um, raffle to win a house or something like that. So um, absolutely always be extremely wary of anyone who's offering you something for nothing. Yeah, you'll never have to pay to claim a sweepstakes or a prize. That's, that's a common scam. So if, if, if you're hearing those things, don't believe it, you didn't win anything. Uh, they're just trying to get you to pay. And as soon as you do, they're going to be gone and you're not going to get any money. Uh, yeah, don't uh, believe any of the scams where people are calling you offering uh, to put you in a raffle or a drawing by releasing your private information. It's just a trick to get you to release your information. A lot of times, in almost all the times I've checked into these, there's no real drawing. Um, and if the one of the most concerning things about the devices Mary was talking about, if, they, if anyone's giving you free multiple hundred dollar devices such as Apple watches or uh, uh, Bluetooth devices, anything like that, 
understand that these devices can record. They record all the thing, all the audio that's going on in your house and around you if you're wearing it. They record your voice. They record your face. They record what you're saying. Um, any passwords you enter into it, any devices that you log into, once it's logged in and it stays connected, those can be accessed remotely. Uh, just realize that if somebody gives you a device loaded with a code uh, that has like a, a back door, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, as soon as you're using that device in your home with all of your devices, they can log back into it and also access all your devices. So these, these things are just too good to be true. And, you know, they're going to collect all your information that way. Larry was just talking about scams targeting immigrants. Uh, scammers are calling people attempting to exploit the fears of persons new to the United States. Uh, they're actually targeting areas. Uh, you know, they're, they're researching, they're looking at online, they're uh, trying to find out areas where people are congregating and they're targeting those. They're doing uh, blanket calls, uh, just cold calling people, trying to find people that are susceptible or that maybe don't understand the way things work in the United States. They play on the people's fear of deportation and their lack of understanding of our laws. They convince people that they owe money for immigration fees that don't really exist or taxes that don't exist. And that if they don't, the police will come and arrest and deport them. Uh, they pose as police, they pose as uh, immigration officers. Uh, the victims are often unaware of how our government works and they don't know that the government does not collect debts this way. And that they don't collect debts via gift cards or money transfers. Assisted scam. These scammers call, write, or email you with an elaborate scam about how they're desperate and they need your help, usually financially. They promise you that they'll repay in full plus interest uh, of a large sum uh, once you send them money or uh, they either disappear or request more money. Either way, you never get paid back. Immigration assistance uh, getting to the United States is one of the uh, types of scams that they do. Uh, another type is refugee assistance in escaping a home country where there's a bad situation, like uh, Haiti, where a lot of uh, natural disasters have happened and people are looking to get out. Uh, helping someone out of debt, helping someone pay back taxes, helping someone bail relatives out of jail, needing money for customs fees for an inheritance, it was one we worked recently, needing money for their business startup, or helping a person bring their family to the United States. We're not telling you not to help people if you uh, carefully evaluate a situation and decide that it's what you want to do. We're just sharing how a lot of these instances from unknown cars are fraudulent and how to be cautious of that. You always check to make sure something's real before you decide that you want to contribute. Romance scam. This is a big one. Due to the ever-increasing manner in which people are meeting romantic partners online, through social media, dating applications, and, and just through um, online contacts, there's been a significant increase in romance scams. Scammers create fake accounts on dating websites using fake information and pictures of attractive people that they take off of the internet. They build a friendship and relationship with elders, playing on their desires for companionship and exploiting the sharing of information people do when meeting someone and getting to know one another. And I think that these are the most challenging um, scams to um, investigate and also for victims to truly um, report as a crime. People become uh, emotionally invested in these fake relationships, um, even to the point of they're not even being like rational any further. We have a situation where um, an elder man um, believes, truly believes he's being contacted by Reba McIntyre and has been sending Reba McIntyre uh, loaded gift cards. Even when he's confronted with the fact that um, this is clearly not Reba McIntyre um, and he's just very focused on um, wanting this relationship to be real. So these are very challenging um, situations for victims to acknowledge that they're actually being completely manipulated and used. 
And I think the best way to uh, make sure that something isn't suspicious is to think about it from another perspective. Think about that if it wasn't somebody you were interested in romantically, would it be a red flag to you? Would, would you be cautious of what you're being asked if it wasn't somebody that you had feelings of, of love for? And then you can help weed out the stuff that just doesn't make sense or seems wrong. Uh, we were recently working a case together where uh, an elderly uh, male was contacted online uh, in a dating app and the profile was false. It was uh, made with a lot of fake information, but it was a really convincing one with photographs from all over the world and uh, a very convincing story. Uh, this person bought into uh, the lies and was convinced, uh, ended up sending the suspect over a million dollars of their money. Uh, even then, when people around this uh, victim reported it uh, out of concern, he refused to believe that uh, he was being victimized and ended up sending more money to the suspect. Uh, luckily, we've had an update. We've been able to uh, work with the federal government to identify the suspects and we're working on bringing them into custody. Uh, unfortunately, you'll probably never see the money again. That's the sad part. But always be wary of any romantic situation that is asking you to pay money. You just, uh, like we said, think about it from another perspective to see if it makes sense or not. Here's some advice for elders on how to prevent and combat abuse and exploitation. Always know that it can happen to you or your loved one. Stay connected. Being isolated makes an elder more vulnerable to exploitation. Create a financial roadmap. Draft a plan that makes it clear what is normal and what is not regarding how your money is spent. Share it with a financial professional or someone you trust that isn't dependent on you. Beware of dependence. It may sound harsh, but supportive arrangements can be exploited. Set boundaries for your dependent. Report your concerns. If you think a loved one is being taken advantage of or abused, contact local law enforcement or adult protective services. And don't be afraid to ask uh, to question what you're told. Ask why something is necessary and make sure it's necessary before you give out any information. All right, I think we're at a point where we can open it up for some questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. We have a question that was written in. What if I am not a family member, but I become aware of a family member scamming somebody that I know, what should I do? So if, if it's not gonna put your safety in a predicament to direct report it, um, then I would contact your local law enforcement. If you're living with the, the suspect, or are close enough to the suspect that it could endanger your safety, all, you can go online like I had talked about earlier and report it anonymously. And also uh, Adult Protective Services is, is also a resource that's available um, to um, do a, a softer investigation, if you will, of the suspected abuse. Okay, thank you. The next question again was written in, what should I do if I realize I may have been scammed after the fact? Is there a number or an office I should call to report this? Um, we've covered a lot of different types of scams. It, it, does, it depends, first of all, what type of scam it is and where you are. Uh, normally, when you want to report being victimized, you start with your local police department or sheriff's office, depending on you live in if you live in an incorporated or unincorporated area. So um, you can find if you find out, you can call uh, your local police department non-emergency line and ask if they serve your address. If you're not sure, and they will tell you whether or not you live in the uh, like a, a city police district or a county sheriff's district, and then they'll route you to the uh, correct dispatcher. And absolutely, you can report uh, suspected scams after the fact. Absolutely. You can report it to law enforcement. I would encourage that as soon as possible. Also to uh, the different elder protective groups throughout the area that will also investigate. There's mandatory cross-reporting between those agencies. So as long as it comes into one, everyone will find out eventually. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Ellis. Is the Medicare helpline advertised on television by Joe Namath and George Foreman 
a scam or is it legitimate? That one I'm going to have to look into. Yeah, we'll need to research that. However, I believe that um, those commercials create the impression that they are sponsored by Medicare, but they're actually a for fee service, not a for free service provided by Medicare. Okay, thank you. From Patrick, we have a question. Why do we still receive robocalls? I thought there was a law against them. Are telephone companies doing anything or being held responsible for this? That's a difficult question. Yes, there are laws against it. The laws have been changed recently uh, to allow for different types of solicitation calls. Um, that's kind of uh, open Pandora's box for these robocalls. I mean, I was getting, I got three of them before I showed up here this morning. Uh, the phone companies are doing what they can. And when I say phone companies, the cellular service carriers that we all use are doing what they can to identify uh, patterns um, out of area calls that are not normal to your uh, your line, and they're they're creating different types of software to catch those calls and stop them before you uh, they make it to you. Uh, a lot of times you'll have those calls you'll see on your phone. It'll ring one time and then it'll it'll say uh, possible spam or or possible fraud call, and it'll stop it from continuing to ring. So it still lets you know that you were contacted, but it stops it. So there are things being done. Um, the days of having, like being able to put yourself on a no call list for solicitation, those are, those are behind us, unfortunately. Um, we just have to try and sift through this, but there are different things you can do to block uh, calls. Um, you can program your phone, you even just uh, receive calls from uh, pre-identified numbers if you want to do it that way. But, uh, that's probably something that your local tech uh, provider, uh, whether, you know, I don't know if you have Apple or Samsung or who you go to your phone carrier can assist you with on how to set up your phone to block those incoming calls. Okay. The next question is, is there extra protection if I make online purchases with my credit card versus my debit card? Depending on how your bank accounts are set up. The way I understand it, a debit card comes directly out of an account that you have it attached to. Uh, a credit card is basically credit that you get from that, that company, that credit barrier that can be, uh, you know, depending on, on how your credit is, you can get large amounts of credit right when you open a card. Um, the debit cards are usually based on an existing balance. And even though you can overdraft them a little bit, eventually the bank will stop that. Um, I believe both have protection, but I think you're better protected on a credit card because they, you can decline those charges or say that they're fraudulent and you can get a lot more assistance with uh, getting those charges reversed or being relieved of them than you would with a debit card where it's supposed to be based on your actual bank account balance. You're only supposed to be able to purchase up to the amount in your account, maybe within $100 or so. So, and with regard to um, elder financial abuse, we have, for example, um, a case where a caregiver opened about 15 credit cards in our victim's name um, and charged over $80,000. And the credit card companies, once we were able to prove that those cards were opened fraudulently, uh, reversed the charges uh, on on all of the accounts. So the credit card companies are very, um, they work cooperatively with law enforcement when we have elder abuse. Most of the time when you file a police report and take that to a credit card company, they'll relieve you of the fraudulent charges. Um, but with the, the debit accounts, um, once your money's spent, it's difficult for the bank to give it back to you because they've already paid it to vendors or wherever it was spent. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is a law firm wants to represent me in a legal action, and they want me to sign a power of attorney and contract. How do I check to see if it is legitimate? I would have some questions about that myself. Um, 
I definitely you need to consult your local law enforcement about that. Um, you would never have to sign away your power of attorney to have someone represent you. They can represent you as an as a licensed attorney. They don't need to have you give up your authority over your decision making in your accounts and so forth. I would contact um, the Contra Costa County um, Bar Association um, for advice related to that. Yeah, they would have a record of that firm and if they were legitimate and licensed, and definitely worth making a report over. Okay. The next question is, is there an office that I can send an email to if I'm not sure the email communication is legitimate, but I would be interested in responding if it isn't a scam? I would suggest that you contact the organization that the email came to you from and not via email, but maybe um, go online and get a telephone number for them and contact them and then discuss the email that you've received with the organization to make sure it's legitimate. Okay, we have a question from Dave. For those of us who are financially savvy, I'm a fraud in investigator and a CPA, what is your view of scam baiting? Sorry, scam dating? Scam, scam uh huh, scam baiting. That's not something, a term that I've experienced. Maybe if Dave could write back to you and explain what, uh, what in particular he'd like to know about that. Is that a term you've heard before? I have not. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Let's see here. Some of these questions you've already answered. Here's one. What happens to people who are scammers and they get caught? Sometimes depending on the type of scam or the way they went about it and the amount of monetary loss it helps us classify it as a misdemeanor or a felony. And then it, it goes to our, uh, we package up the case and present it to the DA. If we meet the burden of proof, she would file a case and it would go through the legal system for a criminal, criminal penalty. Thank you all so much for attending and, and listening to us today and for all of your, your excellent questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. That's the end of our webinar for today. If you have any additional questions, please do call or uh, call the Office of Assemblymember Bauer Cahan or you can go to our website and fill out the um, form, the contact form. Thank you again, Detective Williams and Attorney Knox for your time today. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thank you.